So I'm looking forward to Dr. Solomon's presentation on advances and challenges in immunologic therapy for breast cancer. Dr. Solomon. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Loftus. Thank you uh, to the SMA for um, inviting me to come and talk to you today. And thanks for hanging in there on a Friday afternoon and uh, attending the talk. So uh, as Laura mentioned, I'm, I'm a medical oncologist uh, like her, and she's my colleague. I've been working together for a long time at Moffitt. And uh, my main interest over the years is I've been trying to find ways that we can use immunologic techniques to try to treat breast cancer. Um, I would say that you know when I first started in this job, uh, immunology, especially in breast cancer, you know, it was kind of viewed as being a bit of a redheaded stepchild uh, without a lot of buy-in, you know, or interest. But uh, over the years now, with the explosion of a lot of the new uh, treatments that are happening for cancer, it's kind of taken on a new renaissance, if you will, and, and level of interest that's very exciting for the field. So I'm happy to be here to share some of our work and go over some of the things that are important to understand about this approach. So um, this is a key paper for anybody that's interested in cancer, what makes it tick. I'd highly advise you to read it and, and understand it because I think it provides a roadmap for all of us that are interested in the cancer uh, as to what is critical uh, and what is required to make a cancer, uh, you know, essentially function as a tumor. And um, it's known as the hallmarks of cancer. And initially when this paper was published by Hannan and Weinberg uh, many years ago, it had about six key processes. Uh, most of those had to do with, uh, in essence, um, evading like growth suppression and growing out of control, which most of us understand cancer cells do. Uh, they grow in an unchecked manner. Uh, they don't die. So again, that was a, a key you know, uh, uh, property of cancer cells that we understood from a long time. Um, they also have genetic instability, so they tend to acquire a lot of mutations, right? And then they become immortal, so they're able to replicate without dying. Most of our normal cells, they replicate to a certain extent and then they're programmed to die after a certain number of divisions or to become senescent. Whereas cancer cells attain this like uh, property of immortality where they can keep going, um, you know, basically indefinitely. And that's why we have some of these kind of cancer cell lines that we grow in the lab, like uh, the cancer cell line HALA that came from Henrietta Lacks. You know, it was isolated uh, over like 70 years ago, I think, from her. And it's still being used in labs today because it's immortal, basically. So. One of the key developments, though, that occurred recently was with the update of the paper in 2011 was a recognition that in addition to these kind of um, um, prior properties of cancer, that the role of the immune system played a key role in how cancers develop in a, in a healthy individual. So uh, for the first time, they, they made avoidance of immune destruction a key hallmark of cancer. And that's what we understand now, is that any patient who shows up in our oncology clinic diagnosed with a cancer, with a tumor, those cancer cells had to long ago figure out how to get around that host's immune system in order to show up as a tumor. So in essence, most cancers that we diagnose are some failure of the host immune system to surveil the body and knock off those abnormal cells before they're ever destined to cause trouble. Okay, that's a key uh, property of cancer that you have to understand. And the idea is that we have to, in essence, roll the clock back, if you will, on these cancer cells in order to get them to respond to immunologic therapy. Okay, so that's the challenge, right? Is that the tumors that we diagnose, we're already way past you know, them being very responsive, especially when it comes to breast. The idea is that we need to do therapies that will re-energize the immune system or allow it to recognize the cancer cells as a target and start to take care of the problem. And so one of the key principles to, that is also important in this evolution of cancer over time is a property called immunoediting. So the idea is that it's kind of Darwinian in a way, that the cancer cells that form from normal tissue and become transformed, so this is an example of the various things that can lead to cancer formation, viruses, radiation, environmental insults, take normal tissue and start turning them into cancer cells, right? The ones that are very visible to the immune system, okay, they're the ones that can get knocked off and you are protected. So you never actually develop a tumor, okay? It's the ones that figure out how to get under the radar and in essence not get eliminated up front, but kind of lie low for a while and smolder, right? And over time, they kind of bide their time and wait until the moment's right, until they've acquired the right mutations in order to break loose and grow unchecked as a tumor, all right? And so 
the idea is that in order for our, our treatments to have a, an effect, we have to shut down a bunch of these different mechanisms or tricks that the cancer cells have learned to use over time to shut your immune system down. That's the whole principle behind cancer immunotherapy nowadays, is trying to figure out how do we take away these protective mechanisms from the cancer cell and roll the clock back on them so that your immune system can properly recognize them and eliminate them, okay? So this is, in a nutshell, summarizing a lot of data, but that's the take-home message from this principle. Now, not to, uh, again, overwhelm you, but this is just kind of a snapshot of the sheer complexity of the problem that we're dealing with, okay, is that this is an example of the various interactions that occur between a T cell, right, which is uh, part of your adaptive immune response that responds to antigens and specific targets and proliferates in order to give you a, a certain kind of uh, specific or unique uh, immunity against a specific target, and an antigen-presenting cell, right? So the antigen-presenting cells are kind of like the cops in the immune system. They're the ones that are going around presenting antigens to our immune system, telling them what they should activate against, and also, importantly, what they should not activate against, right? And so there's this fine balance and, and dance that occurs between these cell populations in order to regulate your immune system so that on one hand, you don't have complete energy where you don't respond appropriately to an antigen, but at the same time, you don't have unchecked autoimmunity, which leads to a lot of the diseases that we treat and see in our clinics all the time, like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. And so the idea is that these um, kind of response signals or regulators of the immune response, uh, they're generally termed as checkpoints. That's, that's what they're called in, in the general nomenclature. So many of our new therapies that you hear about, like you know the therapy that uh, President Carter got for his melanoma and some of these other high-profile treatments that have occurred are known as checkpoint therapy. It's because we've developed essentially monoclonal antibodies or targeted drugs that interfere with these negative regulatory signals. And the key ones that have come to the clinic so far is um, a, a checkpoint that's known as CTLA-4 right, and another one that's called PD-1, right, and so we have a couple of drugs out now, uh, classes of drugs that block these negative signals in a way so that it allows the T cell when it sees a piece of the cancer cell and interacts with the antigen presenting cell, if you block that negative signal, which is usually turned on in cancer, it allows the T cell to activate and mobilize against the cancer cells, right. And the point of this slide is just to tell you that these first couple of drugs that have come out to the market and have revolutionized cancer therapy are kind of the tip of the iceberg. These are just an example of the many different targets that we're currently developing therapies for, in essence, to try to manipulate these very signals so that we block the negative signals and we amplify the positive signals. That's, that's really the, the whole gist of what we're trying to do is increase the positive signal so we egg on the T cells to activate against the cancer and actually block some of the negative signals that are hampering or dampening that T cell response against the cancer. So this is an example of now the, the landscape, if you will, or the, the therapeutic kind of uh, strategy that we as oncologists are trying to apply in the treatment of patients with cancer. And the idea here is that um, Dr. Chen um, published, along with Ira Melman, who they both worked for Genentech and Roche, uh, a seminal paper that actually reviewed a lot of the key processes that need to happen in order for the immune system to successfully engage the cancer and eradicate it, okay? And so they described a series of processes that have to happen each in sequence properly in order for the immune system to successfully control a cancer. And so you have to have initially starting with the release of the target. So these cancer cells are dying and they're spewing out all these targets into the, into the periphery, into the blood, into the cytoplasm and cytosol around uh, in the ectoplasm around the cell. Now these targets here are taken up by antigen presenting cells. They have to traffic to lymph nodes and then or go into blood vessels and to adjacent lymph nodes as well. But they have to activate T cells uh, in the lymph nodes and have effective activation of those T cells to allow them to proliferate. Then they have to actually go and traffic to the tumor site and get to the tumor site successfully, recognize the target, 
activate properly, and then kill those cells and start that cycle all over again. So you have this whole cycle of cell death, releasing antigens, activating other T cells. They go attack the cells, and the circle keeps going on and on and on, right? And the reason why this is important is because when we give drugs, like small molecules, right, they're, they're fairly dumb, right? They don't really adapt to the cancer. A chemical is a chemical. And what happens often with the kind of drugs that we give is that cancer cells are smart. They know how to evolve and get around your therapy eventually, right? Whereas the immune system is somewhat of an intelligent, you know, functioning system. It can actually roll with the cancer and adapt over time so that if the cancer says, well, if you're going to go after this target, all these cells are going to die. I'm going to end up expressing a different target so I can get around you. Well, your immune system can pick up on that and actually shift and pivot so it attacks that other target now. So the, the reason why this is critical is that when you look at the clinical trials that are ongoing and you see how patients benefit from immun immunotherapy, as opposed to the drugs we give, which can lead to maybe months of progression-free survival, and then eventually they progress when they have metastatic disease, some of these patients are actually appear to be functionally cured. If they have a complete response where their immune system is totally engaged, they can go on for years and years and years with durable control and no regrowth of the cancer. And that's because the cancer can adapt to your cancer cells and surveil your body and pick them off as they try to come up. So that's the critical reason why this kind of therapy can be a real game changer when it comes to helping patients, especially those with metastatic disease. So this is just kind of a little bit of a, a, a listing of the various things that go wrong in breast cancer from your immune system standpoint that allow the cancer to grow. And um, some of the issues that I'm identified is that uh, part of our immune system uses these helper T cells, and they're kind of like the quarterbacks, if you will, in the immune system that help direct how your T cells activate and when they should go after a particular target. And we have diminished numbers of these helper cells that work well uh, when a patient has a, a large cancer burden. Uh, also, the killer T cells, they're known as CD8 positive cells, so these are the actual soldiers that go in and knock off the cancer cells. They also have an impaired ability to activate, so the cancer figures out ways to basically shut them down or stiff arm them when they get into the tumor microenvironment. There's also higher numbers of these circulating T regulatory cells, so their job is actually to withhold a response or to block it, and they protect against autoimmunity. The problem is, Cancer cells often know how to get these Tregs to proliferate more often, and they can actually help recruit these immune suppressive cells on their behalf to thwart your immune system's ability to take out the cancer cells. So it's a very cunning way, in essence, that they enlist your own immune system to try to get around it, your own defenses. Um, there's also additional cells that are involved in suppressing your immune system that become dysfunctional in the presence of cancer, such as myeloid-derived suppressor cells, we call them as well. And then finally, there are a whole host of metabolic derangements or disorders that occur in a tumor that will shut down your immune system and, and keep it from properly functioning as well. So there's a multifaceted problem, if you will, when we're dealing with immune suppression and cancer, and so it takes a multifaceted approach to reverse a lot of these uh, problems in order to get your immune system functioning properly again. Now, when it comes specifically to breast cancer, what I'll tell you is that as a researcher in the field and somebody who's been doing it for a while, um, we're considered not very high on the list of cancers that are responsive to immune treatment. Okay, The typical diseases that were first out of the gate that led to approvals of these drugs are cancers like melanoma, like lung cancer, uh, some types of colon cancer, and we also have approvals for other cancer types like bladder cancer as well. Some skin cancers or head and neck cancers are also on the horizon too. They're felt to be more immunogenic, okay, or more recognized by the immune system than breast cancer is. And why is that? Well, there are multiple reasons. One of the reasons is thought that breast cancer, which is um, highlighted here in this red circle, tends to have a lower number of mutations on average than other tumor types that are felt to be immune responsive like melanoma and like lung cancer. And why is that? Because a lot of those cancers like melanoma and lung cancer are associated with certain carcinogens that amp up that mutation rate, like excessive UV exposure uh, leading to like melanomas or excessive exposure to carcinogens from tobaccos. 
consumption, right? So there are reasons why that, that is the case, but this is one example of those um, reasons why breast cancer may not give off as many of those danger signals to your immune system and act more like your own self-tissues, basically. So here's the, um, one of the questions that they asked me to kind of uh, put into the presentation um, for you too. And I think some of you may have done it online or, or had um, the opportunity to review it. But it's basically reiterating the key point that I just went over is breast cancer being, is, is viewed as not being responsive to checkpoint therapy compared to other tumor types, why? And again, uh, some of the answers are breast cancer does not elicit an immune response. Breast cancer does elicit immune response, but it's frequently attenuated by the time it's diagnosed. C, breast cancer exhibits fewer abnormal antigens compared to other tumor types, or D, both B and C. And uh, the um, correct answer um, for that is D, right? So the idea is that uh, there is a misconception that breast cancer does not elicit any kind of immune response, and that's not correct. Breast cancer does elicit an immune response. However, it's frequently attenuated by the time we diagnose it. Right? And so uh, Dr. Zernicki, who you heard earlier, uh, who's also an a, a immunology researcher as well, is focused on how can we restore that immune responsiveness in very early stage breast cancer through the use of vaccines against specific targets like HER2. Right? So that's one of the key kind of ideas that we're trying to um, employ is how can we re-energize that immune system to um, ex exploit that immune response that is there in the beginning. So. Now, what I told you is that it's a multifaceted problem, right? There's multiple issues going on. So there is going to come a time where we have to, in essence, take all these different agents that we're developing. So I showed you this whole Chinese menu of all these different kind of agents that are being developed right now for immunotherapy, right? There are so many different combinations of agents and so many different permutations of these different drugs that we could give in clinical trials. There isn't actually mathematically enough cancer patients in the world to even test all these combinations. Right? That's, that's one of the challenges that we run into, just from the sheer number of possible combinations that we could use. So we are going to have to adopt a rational approach for identifying what are the key problems in that particular person's cancer that are leading to the immune dysfunction and target those key pathways specifically for their cancer, as opposed to doing a one-size-fits-all approach for all patients with a particular kind of cancer. And so this is an example of uh, you know, how some breast cancers, for example, may present as what we would call like hot or inflamed tumors, right? And they're characterized by tumors that are actively recognized by the immune system and have T cells and other immune cells trafficking into them, which we can see them under a microscope when we get a sample of the tumor. However, the tumor is actively suppressing and thwarting that immune infiltration over time. That's how it's getting around that activated response. So we would call this a hot tumor, right? And so the idea is, okay, if you have a hot tumor there, the key is to try to basically take away that blocking mechanism and then just let the T cells do their thing and they should be able to activate and control the tumor. Whereas you have, what happens in a lot of breast cancers is a relatively cold tumor, right? And the tumor is characterized by a very bland, quiet environment, okay? There's not a lot of activated T cells. There's not a lot of active inflammation. And you have a lot of these suppressive cells that are just hanging out there, right? And basically telling your immune system to go away, leave me alone, right? That's the challenge. So what we have to do in this case is actually take away these suppressive populations first to even give your immune system a chance to be able to get in there and figure out what's going on, right? And so that's the point of the slide, is just trying to tell you that it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all. Based on whether it's a hot tumor or a cold tumor, we may have to do different manipulations, in essence, in order to try to get this active immune response triggered so that it starts controlling the tumor and eradicating it. And this is just reiterating some of the data around what makes a tumor potentially hot or cold. What are some of the manipulations or things that we can do to trigger that change, right? So there's increasing evidence that hot tumors, in essence, that have a lot of these infiltrating lymphocytes that we can see under the microscope is a very powerful prognostic factor for breast cancer. And it's actually being advocated that it, it may potentially very soon be added to our traditional staging 
criteria that we use. So when we say a woman's stage one versus stage two, we do that in order to inform physicians and the patient about the natural history of their disease and their overall prognosis. There's actually coming um, a, a time where we may, may have to integrate things like how the immune system is responding to the tumor in order to fully suss out the various factors that lead to whether they have a poor prognosis or a good prognosis. And women that have a robust immune response against their tumor tend to have a better prognosis than those that don't. Okay? So the other part, too, is that it may be predictive. So there's been multiple studies that actually show that if you have a tumor that is actively infiltrated with these immune cells, right, and a surgeon often will send me, a medical oncologist, a patient with a tumor before they take them to surgery and say, can you give her or him therapy before surgery to get the tumor to die down and shrink so that it'll facilitate breast conservation or our resection or so that we can see how well your therapy worked before surgery. That's called neoadjuvant therapy, right? And what we can see is that the ones that are very inflamed have a higher response rate to neoadjuvant therapy than those that are not inflamed or that are bland. Okay, so not only is it a prognostic factor, but it may be also a predictive factor for the response to neoadjuvant therapies, right? So knowing some of this information that we want to see some of this inflammation, the key question becomes how can we manipulate the tumor to boost what we call these tumor infiltrating lymphocytes or TILs for short, that's the terminology that you may hear from time to time. How can we take a cold tumor or a bland one and boost that TIL infiltrate in order to enhance the response rates to neoadjuvant therapy or improve their prognosis, okay? And so this is just another question uh, summarizing some of the information we went through as well. So the parts of the tumor microenvironment that regulate how well a T cell can target uh, breast cancer cells, right? And I showed you some of these different elements, right, in the figure. Uh, tumor cells, the tumor vasculature, the tumor stroma, including fibroblasts, uh, other immune cells and the cytokines that they secrete, or E, all of the above. And the correct answer for the question is all of the above, right? And so the, the point is that when you look at a tumor, it's no longer just the tumor cells in there that you're worried about. It's a whole ecosystem of all these various cell types that are recruited by your, your cancer to propagate and to spread. So you have to address the tumor as a kind of a holistic uh, group of various cell and actors that have to be targeted in order to improve the microenvironment and enhance the immune response. And that's why we have to do this kind of multi-pronged uh, therapy approach, if you will, in order to get the best immune response possible, is we have to address some of these other elements in the tumor in order to improve the immune system. So this is um, a publication that we, uh, we were able to publish this year. Um, and the research that we were conducting was looking at the role of signals called chemokines, right? So chemokines are homing signals that are secreted by various cells in your body that act as instructions or homing signals to tell your immune cells where to go, right? So they follow these signals, in essence, from various locations. And that's how your immune cells, in essence, know how to come out from, say, the blood uh, in, in a particular location where there's an infection seep out of those blood vessels and then go attack bacteria and start to gobble them up or destroy uh, offending pathogens in order to eliminate that infection, okay? And so these chemokines are important for normal physiologic activation of your immune system. However, it turns out that when cancers form, they can also start to abnormally secrete potentially some of these homing signals as a byproduct of their abnormal metabolism and the mutations they've acquired. So this became a key question for us because we thought that, well, maybe tumors that are hot, like I showed you before, they may give off more of these homing signals than the cold ones. So they, they kind of are able to lie low under the radar because they're not giving off as many of these signals. And what we actually found is that by looking at a group of 12 genes that correspond to these various chemokine signals, right, that when they were very high uh, in the tumor, in some cases the levels were so high that they not only caused an infiltration of some immune cells, they actually formed almost like uh, ectopic lymph node structures, we call them, within the tumor. 
So they're almost like forward operating bases, if you will, for the immune system, whereas they weren't just going to draining lymph nodes in a basin nearby. They were actually forming lymph nodes right there in the tumor, right? And you could see them under the microscope. So what we noticed is when we saw these various like high chemokine tumors, they were associated with certain very aggressive subtypes of breast cancer. And when we looked at it, uh, they tended to be highest in the group that we call basal and HER2 enriched. So the basal tend to cluster with tumors that we call triple negative breast cancer, where they're negative for the estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and the HER2 protein. And these are targets that we routinely test for in breast cancer in order to help us uh, dictate what kind of systemic therapy we provide to uh, breast cancer patients. The HER2 enriched generally tend to be the women that overexpress HER2 uh, protein. And those are the kind of cancers that we treat with drugs like Herceptin, for example, right? So these more biologically aggressive tumors actually also give off more of these danger signals or homing signals that we found as well. And when we actually looked under the microscope to try to see, well, can we prove that when breast tumors have this very high signal, do they form these ectopic lymph nodes? And they do. So when we took the very highest level of these tumors and looked at them on a microscope, you could see these clusters of these little small blue lymphocytes forming in the tumor periphery. And they weren't only T cells, some of them were also B cells and other infiltrating cells that were acting as their own kind of outsourced lymph node right there within the, the tumor. Whereas when they had a low score, it was characterized by mostly tumor cells and kind of bland fibrous tissue. So you didn't see as much of those kind of uh, ectopic lymph nodes uh, being formed in the tumor. So this kind of supported our hypothesis that this was a key factor in differentiating hot from cold tumors, okay? And again, going back to what I said is that there is a prognostic, uh, you know, uh, um, signal there when you have a very hot tumor that they may do better. And when we look at the survival of patients uh, in the red that have these very inflamed or um, high tumors versus those that are low or the black line, when you look at all comers, when it comes to recurrence-free survival or overall survival, um, that the patients who had these inflamed tumors tended to do better overall for the entire group, but that when we looked at the tumor type, um, it was predominantly seen in the triple negative and the HER2 positive being the most uh, dominant one, okay? Um, so then to show you a little bit of what we're doing, in treating these patients with breast cancer in order to turn cold tumors to hot tumors, we actually have a trial now where we're injecting these tumors with what's known as an oncolytic virus. And so we're using this virus called TVEC, which is a, a herpes simplex 1 virus, or the cold sore virus, that's been genetically engineered to give off some of these uh, danger signals and selectively can cause cancer cells to burst while leaving normal cells alone. Right? And so we're directly injecting the virus into these tumors that are diagnosed, um, and triple negative breast cancer is a subtype that we're treating now. And what you can see here is this is just an example of breast cancer metastases that were injected under the skin. Um, and you can see that they start to die off and go away. But the key thing is not only that the tumors that were injected, which were a couple of them, died, but actually the other uninjected ones also died. So it was a spreading effect as well that allowed the eradication of the breast cancer. And so this is just a description of the ongoing phase one, two study that we have uh, going on at Moffitt. And this is just an electron microscopy picture of the virus that's been genetically engineered that we're injecting into the tumor. So they come in and they get an ultrasound basically to measure the tumor. And then we direct a needle into the tumor via ultrasound in order to inject this oncolytic virus. And this is just an example of, of that injection process that's going on when we're treating one of these women with these triple negative breast cancers. They also happen to be getting their chemotherapy as part of this treatment, so that we're trying to see if they can synergize together to do a one-two punch to eradicate the tumor better. Um, and then I just want to kind of breeze through this real quick here, is that this is an example of one of the drugs that you may have heard about uh, with these checkpoint therapies, pembrolizumab or Keytruda as it's known. And it actually has um, fairly reasonable activity in patients with metastatic triple negative breast cancer. However, it appears that, um, again, it's not the majority. It's still the minority of patients that respond to this. So the goal is to try to see if we can improve our, our ability to enhance the responses over time. And so 
Another thing that we're looking at is moving up these therapies earlier in the sequence of treatment so that as patients may get uh, beat up a little bit more with our systemic therapies and their immune uh, system may get further depleted, if we treat them earlier on, they may be in a better position to respond actively to the drugs. Okay, so we may be uh, doing the patients a disservice by waiting till they're heavily pretreated. We may need to treat them further up the chain in order to get the best activity that we want to see. And that's why we're also doing the iSPY2 trial at Moffitt, which is combining this pembrolizumab uh, with adjuvant, neoadjuvant chemotherapy in order to boost the response rates. And we've seen some pretty promising signals so far that it's improved the response rate in triple negative breast cancer from 20% to 60%. And so this is a promising area of investigation. As you can see, it's taking off worldwide. Uh, there's over 59 active studies around the world just for breast cancer with various checkpoint combinations. So this is a very active area of investigation. Um, and so this is just, again, one of the final questions is looking at the highest response rates that have been reported for metastatic breast cancer using checkpoint monotherapy. And the answer is in triple negative breast cancer that stains positive for PD-1. And Again, this is just showing, again, reiterating that adding pembrolizumab to neoadjuvant therapy in the iSPY trial had a significant improvement in the response rate as well. And finally, I just wanted to use this uh, opportunity to tell you that it's a multifaceted approach, too, in terms of how we are trying to treat these cancers with using both vaccines, immunogenic chemotherapy, and immune stimulators and immune modulating drugs in order to try to get an enhanced immune response. And so we're using all these approaches currently in the treatment of women with breast cancer. So this is just to wrap it up. The take home messages are that various elements of breast tumors contribute to immune suppression. And we need to target these multiple defects in order to get the best outcomes. Breast cancer can respond to immunotherapy, especially triple negative breast cancer, but will require combination strategies to improve activity. We need to better understand how the immune system evolves during cancer progression and treatment so that we can personalize therapy for our patients. And using it earlier in the course of breast cancer may uh, give us the best outcomes over time. And thank you for your attention.